Welcome to the Suicide Prevention Show. We are launching the Make It a Great Day movement that is now in the process of shifting, and that's what this weekend is all about. We understood that helping someone identify that they had the power always to make it a great day, that they always had the choice to do that, that's true and it's powerful and that's why we chose that as the title of our book series make it a great day the choice is yours but the truth is it didn't speak to the problem the problem is suicide the challenge is how do you prevent something that you don't know you're at risk for and that's what we're here for so the suicide prevention movement is launching with this show where we are now making suicide, especially teen suicide, a thing of the past. That's our mission in the world. And we're happy that you're here. Matter of fact, super happy. And here's why we're happy you're here for this episode. Please welcome with me an amazing, amazing woman, very special soul. And she's going to speak about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. We're going to deep dive into how stress gets an unfair advantage. And we're going to cover seven ways that you can take control, seven effective ways. That's always important. So would you please welcome to the studio. Come on in, Miss Sherry. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> happy to see you too, Jackie. How are you? I am well, how are you? Good. So where are you? Would you please tell everybody just where geographically on the planet you're located? Yes, I am in Dallas, Texas, and it is 100 plus degrees here today. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have certainly been gallivanting the globe today. So yeah, so the hot and the cold. So this is absolutely wonderful that you are here. And I have been remiss, so the pause for just one second because so thank you i was like oh no i forgot so <laughs> now now that we've taken care of that and for those who weren't around i had not completed acknowledging a contestant on our last uh contest so we do those on the breaks of the show uh why because we like to give things away so speaking of giving things away sherry this concept of there being seven effective ways to take control. Mm -hmm. What a great gift. Oh my goodness. So let's take them there. Tell us the who and the why of you, and then let's get to it. Well, um, for the past, since 1996, I have been totally focused on uh, factors for success and factors for high performance for individuals and teams and, and people in general. Um, and what I have found over the years is that uh, one of the primary reasons that people underperform is, is the stress response. And they don't, it's also why people get derailed and, and their whole lives get derailed as a result of approaching stress wrong or noticing the wrong things and not understanding what the source of it is. So uh, when we understand the source and we address the problem at the source, then everything changes. So, you know, my whole um, focus is let's find the core issue, let's find the source of the problem and eliminate the source so the problem goes away. Well, there we go. Okay. So eliminating the source of the problem. So let's just define the problem for everybody. What's the problem? Well, the problem- What's so bad about stress? The problems are a myriad. Um, I have a, a slideshow that I would be, I would love to, to share um, that would explain it in, in very detailed fashion and give you the seven. Uh, well, th th there's good and there's bad about a slideshow. Okay. One is that on a podcast, nobody's going to be able to see your slides. Okay. So, you know, if it's all visual, then I'm going to say that we need to be able to talk through them. Oh, no, no, so, we'll, no we'll talk through them okay, for sure. No, cool. it, it, I, just, I just want to be mindful that it's not all visual in my world. And so I know people listen to these and take them in their pockets with them. So right. for, there we go. For those who, and I can also make these slides available if you'd like to Ooh. have available through your 
Um, that would be an awesome gift, Sherry. Yeah. Thank yeah, we you. Could, we could make the slides all available so that people could then see what we're, what we're talking about. <laughs> there we go. Great idea. So, so do you want me to share my screen with you? Yeah, that's going to be the best way to get it done. All right. So then we'll then we'll do a Q and A after the slideshow. If anything I don't any answer, you know, yeah. feel free just to jump right in in the midst of it. Oh well, there we go. You know, I love to have permission to interrupt. Yeah, <laughs> Any, anytime you want to, just jump right in. So, Sherry, I am super excited. All right. So, as you get that, there we go. I think it's going to work. Yay! So, let me do the slideshow from the beginning. Yeah, you we'll see that. There we go. Okay, so I can see that, and it says seven easy and super effective ways to banish stress and live your best life. And that's the ultimate goal. All right. So that's the ultimate goal. So the first thing we want to talk about is how stress gains an unfair advantage. And it's, it does that for many, many people as a result of the fact that you know, they're looking at the wrong things. But we also want to look at how you can kick it to the curb and get your groove back. So that's the, that's the primary thing. How do we recognize it? How do we see that it, the ways that it gets an unfair advantage? And how do we kick it to the curb and get our groove back? So the, the way that stress derails success and why people are so susceptible to it is mm -hmm. the brain functions in a perfectly normal way. And it's that, but what we, what we attend to is what we're doing. We attend to behaviors, our own and other people's. And if we're looking at the behaviors, that is the, that's actually the effect, not the cause. If we're looking at the effect, then and we're trying to manage the effect, we're not going to do a very good job, not for ourselves or for anybody else. So if we're looking at the behaviors of someone else and we're saying, well, they're just being impatient or they're being, you know, you know they're easily distractible or they're just being lazy or they're being irritable, you know, those are behaviors. And if we're seeing those in ourselves, uh, that is also a problem because if we're focusing on those, we're not focusing on the right thing. The right thing to be focusing on is the stress effect. And if you understand that under stress, the amygdala gets active and it starts using a lot of energy. And in order to balance that energy use out so that the, the brain doesn't take all the energy from your body, our, the body has to function still too. The way that the, the brain manages that is, is it reduces the, the function in the prefrontal cortex. Now the stress management center, which is the amygdala, is about emotional release. It's about pleasure seeking. It's about pain avoidance, and all of that is designed to release dopamine and serotonin and endorphin and other feel-good chemicals so that we're not so stressed. And, and yet, in that process of that overactive amygdala, the prefrontal cortex then gets reduced or shut down. And the effect of that is that the executive functions get reduced. Now, what are the executive functions? The very things we need not to be behaving this way right? Not to be forget. So it's clear thinking, it's decision making, it's planning, it's strategizing, all of the things that we need to, to not behave this way. So is it any wonder that with your, with the amygdala being overactive and, and the emotional uh, fuse short and our clear thinking and decision making and planning and strategizing reduced, those functions reduced, that we would be seeing the, the behaviors that look like anger and irritability and impatience and, and poor time management and forgetfulness and fatigue and all of those things that show up that we, that we beat ourselves up over and we, and we start trying to manage in other people too. We're looking at the wrong thing. So that's the reason why um, so I'm going to pause you and, and just say, okay, the, the slides are beautiful, but they're really not going to show up well on people's phones and, you know, they're, they're kind of small. Mm -hmm. So you're giving this wonderful explanation. Do you, do, do you think that maybe we don't need the slides? Um, let me go ahead and use them. Um, but like I said, I'll, I'll give them to you so you can put them on the back end and people can download them. Okay. So it, it would still be useful, I think, for, to have them here. Because you keep talking about something that I'm very confused about. You keep okay. talking about they're looking at the wrong thing. And when so I... They're looking at behaviors. Okay, so, so they're looking at behaviors instead of looking at what? In, instead of understanding that the stress is the factor. 
So, so they need to be addressing stress, not behavior. Stress is the source, is the cause. Behaviors is the result. So, okay. so, so if we're looking, if we're looking, if we're noticing, if we understand the stress response, and we notice that what we need to be doing is managing stress, not not trying to control behaviors, we're going to get a much better result than if we are trying to control behaviors because that is an effect. So our behaviors are the effect of being stressed. What we want to be attending to is, is managing stress. And I'm going to give okay. you seven ways to do that. Awesome. I'm all up for that. <laughs> so the reason people are so susceptible to stress is one, they're noticing behaviors as opposed to the fact that they need to manage stress. And there's also that concept of there's so much to do and so little time to do it in. And so we get really focused on actions, the things that are necessary in the outer world. Uh -huh. and, and those distract us from the thing we need to be attending to, which is reducing our own stress levels. Does that make sense? I think it makes sense that it, what we need to be paying attention to is nothing more than what's our stress level, that that's the root cause of all the behaviors we don't like. What is the stress level and what is causing it? So we need to understand cool. what's causing it. So cool. if we're noticing the effect and we're being self-critical because we're noticing the effect. So mm -hmm. you're, you're, prefrontal cortex is reduced and you're not thinking as clearly as normal, or you're not making decisions as well as you normally do, or um, you want to be planning something and laying things out and that's not happening. You're um, procrastinating doing those things. When that happens, we start beating ourselves up for, for behaving that way. And that just escalates the problem. That just increases stress. So now instead of solving the problem instead of addressing the core issue we've actually advanced it increased it by beating ourselves by being self-critical so one of the first things you need to do is be kind to yourself you know to understand that your brain is working perfect it's doing exactly what it ought to be doing and that when we can say, there's nothing wrong with me. My brain's doing exactly what a good brain does. It's, it's reducing the prefrontal cortex so as not to burn up too much energy so that the, the amygdala can manage stress. So if I start focusing on managing stress, mm -hmm. I can get my prefrontal cortex to kick back in and then I'll be thinking clearly again, and then I'll be making good decisions again. So it's, it's a completely different focus. So you wanna stay focused on reducing stress not managing behaviors. Okay, got that. Stay focused. Sounds like a good plan. Breathe. There's a lot of research that talks that that shows the the positive effect of breathing techniques. And there are 10 of them that you can try at healthline.com. Um, so it's go to healthline.com forward slash health forward slash breathing dash exercise. <laughs> So there, there are 10 exercises there that people can try. So, so some work for some people and some don't for others. So inpatient people tend to do better with different breathing exercises than patient people do. So try some of those 10 and see what happens because just stopping and breathing can help to reduce stress. Got it. Cool. I like that. Be kind to yourself and breathe. Another one is to meditate or do exercises such as yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong. And the reason for those kinds of exercises is they require mental focus. And that mental focus reduces the activity of the amygdala. And when the activity of the amygdala is reduced, then the prefrontal cortex can have some more energy and it can kick back in. So not only do these make you feel better physically, they also help your brain. Cool. I like that. Feel better and help my brain. That's exactly. Yeah. Uh, another thing you can try is what I call appreciative inquiry. And this is, this is a common thing used among uh, coaches and therapists, but appreciative inquiry in this instance, it's about your life. So many times people are looking at appreciative inquiry as it relates to other people, but in this case, it relates to you. And appreciative inquiry has four parts to it. It has the discovery, which is appreciating the best of what is. Mm 
It has the dream step, which is envisioning what could be. So, so what is, what could be. The design, which is constructing what should be. And we have to be real careful about what we think should be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and well, you know, I, I got an opinion about should. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> and, and then the destiny step, which is sustaining what will be. So we've decided what is, what could be, what actually should be, and what will be. That's the appreciative inquiry. And when we're looking at that in relation to our life, we're looking at, um, at the discovery level, we're acknowledging and appreciating or being grateful for what we already have. Mm -hmm. And the, the function of doing that, it greatly reduces stress. It puts us in the here and now. And in the here and now, we are focused on, there's, you know, we're not worried about the past. We're not projecting into the future. We're in the here and now. And that's one of the benefits of um, moving into that appreciative space, that, that grateful, being grateful for what we have. It also opens us up to more of, what, of good things. So if we acknowledge that we have good things and we take ownership of them, the, we, the subconscious mind just starts looking for more of that because that's all feel good stuff. And so we start cool. looking for more things that we can be appreciative of. At the envisioning yeah. level, yeah. we start envisioning ways that we can use all the positive things that, that we already have to empower the life we dream of living. So, so we have lots of positive attributes. It's, it's easy for people to get focused on what's missing, the negatives, mm -hmm. and to ignore the positives. But if you purposefully start looking at all your positive attributes, uh, when I do assertiveness training courses, I ask people to name three things that makes them special or unique, and they have a very hard time doing that. And if I ask them then, if I'd ask you to name three things that you don't like about yourself, how hard would that be? And they go, oh, that would be easy. But we need to change that. We need to become aware of what we have about ourselves to be uh, appreciative of. Mm -hmm. At the constructing, design constructing level, design your life so it aligns with your core values. And in order to do that, we have to know what our core values are. So first, discover what it matters to you. So, and align your life with what matters. That's your core values matter to you. And when we can do that, when we're more aligned with our core values and we're more aligned with what matters to us in life, then we can fulfill our dreams more quickly. That sounds like a good plan. All mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and at the, at the sustaining level, you want to develop skills and talents that support and sustain the life you want to be living. And if, if the things that you're doing, if you're beating yourself up, if you're looking at things that couldn't go wrong, if you're looking at the things about you you don't like, that's the wrong end of the spectrum. The right end of the spectrum is the things you want to add more of. And one of the interesting things about the subconscious mind is it um, works 24 seven to give you what it thinks you want and what it thinks you want is what you're focused on. So if we're focused on the wrong end of the spectrum, it thinks we want the wrong end of the spectrum. Hmm. Well, that makes sense because that's the way that I describe it when it comes to how we end up with a subconscious plan around suicide is that whatever we focus on, our subconscious mind believes that that's what we want. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's another factor there. And the other factor is that the, the primary drive for your subconscious mind is conceptual well-being, not physical well-being. That's secondary. Conceptual well-being. And if your concept of, of suicide is that you're, you'll be better off or somebody that you care about will be better off, then, then that leads, the idea of suicide is, is about, it gets aligned with conceptual well-being and the, and the physical. It's why people can eat, drink, drug, and lifestyle themselves to death and even commit suicide because the primary need is conceptual well-being. Whatever your concepts are, that's what it's seeking to maintain. Got it. So if I have a concept of I need to feel significant and I see no way to get that feeling in my life, then conceptually, I could end up in a place where dying made more sense than living. Exactly. If it was my physical well-being, I could never end up in that space. No, no, you could never get self-preservation mechanism. Right. Right. Self-preservation says, no, no, you take care of yourself. You maintain your physical being, but that's not primary. The primary thing is conceptual well-being. 
And so we need to, we need to not monitor our concepts. Ooh, not as easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing we could do is just to let go. <laughs> We're miserable and stressed to the degree that we think we can control or that we try to control things outside of our direct sphere of influence. And the, the, the COVID, the coronavirus, has brought home to a lot of people that we don't have as much control as we thought we had. But the, that's always been true. We have never had control of the environment outside ourselves. We've never had control of other people. Can we influence other people? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can we teach them and guide them? Absolutely. But we can't control them. The only thing we have control over is ourself. So we can absolutely control our, me our moods. We can absolutely control what we <laughs> think about and what we decide on. We can control that to the degree that we control stress. But if stress is there, we're also out of control of that. So that's why it's so important to manage stress. It's so important to understand, okay, I'm feeling stress. Now what do I do about it? How do I reduce it so I get back in control? But we cannot control other people. We cannot control the, out, the environment. We've never been able to. It's just now it's pretty clear. <laughs> And, yes. and again, to the degree that you think you can control those things, you're going to be unhappy. You're going to be stressed. All right. And, you know, I'm going to flip that because I just realized that you know, what you're saying is absolutely solid. To the degree that we think we can control all of these things that are outside of ourselves, we're going to be miserable. And to the degree that we don't believe and buy into the fact that we can control ourselves, that we right. can influence our stress level, the degree that we don't believe that is also an indicator of how unhappy we're going to be in life. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And that's a really good flip to that, to that concept. Absolutely. Both sides of the, that coin makes that absolutely true. Yeah. So Beautiful. I like that. We do have control of ourselves. If, if we get in that space, if we start doing these behaviors, you know, that will reduce stress to the point. And again, understanding, the goal is to kick your, your cognitive functions back in gear, right? So that we're making good decisions, so that we're thinking clearly, so that we're doing the things that help us navigate life effectively. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, this is, this is lovely. Thank you. The, the sixth one is to turn your critic into an ally. Um, we're all aware of that negative voice that says, you know, you can't do that. Who do you think you are? Don't you dare venture out and try something new. You know, stay here, stay safe. You know, we all, we're all aware of that. We're all aware of that part of us that beats us up when we do something that seems stupid, right? <laughs> but yeah. contrary to popular opinion, your critic is not the enemy. It is not your enemy. What the critic actually is, is the protector, your guardian, gone too far. So the, so the guardian, we all have a guardian and we all have a champion. The guardian avoids pain and the champion seeks pleasure. And so wow. the guardian, where you have this, the champion side of you saying, oh, go out there, you can do anything. You know, you're, you're like a superhero, right? That's, that's the champion. The guardian is going, no, you aren't. Don't you do that. You'll get hurt. And when we don't pay attention to the guardian, when we don't embrace it as a, as a guardian, then it becomes a critic. It gets big and it gets mean because it thinks we have to have big and mean to pay attention. Ah. So if we, if we start listening to that voice and we start talking to what's the critic and we, what do you want me to understand? What do you need me to see or feel or understand here? You know, what are you trying to accomplish for me? you'll be amazed at how quickly you'll get an answer to some of those questions and your, and your former critic becomes what it's meant to be, which is your guardian, your protector. Oh, there we go. Okay. So it's the same part of our brain, just performing a different function. It's, it's again, concepts. It's that subconscious conceptual well-being thing. And if, and if the concept of well-being is that you need to be protected because that story got predicted, created when you were four years old and it hasn't been updated, 
the your protector is still trying to protect the four-year-old it doesn't understand that you're an adult now and you have better skills so when you get connected to it and you and you update the, the information that it has then the relationship to it often changes and changes quickly cool i like quick change yeah me too <laughs> i tell people i'm a brief therapist and the briefer the better if i can get you somewhere in an hour i am not taking days weeks or months to do it <laughs> There we go. We like to get there fast in my world too. Which is, yes, you know. absolutely. So the seventh one, mm -hmm. if all of those things don't work, there is a method that's, that I developed ages ago. I've used it on thousands of people. It's called rapidly accelerated mind patterning. It goes straight to the subconscious mind and eliminates those old stories. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go to vanishblocks.com and read more about it. So that's, oh. that's the third thing. So if great trial, website, that's trial. a great website. I just want to, I just want to highlight this, the, the, the URL for getting more information about how to get to the straight to the subconscious mind is banish blocks, B A N I S H B L O C K S.com. So that's just a lovely, clear, URL and I appreciate that so much. And there's a lot of information there about how the subconscious mind works and why things go awry and how you can change that. Cool. So if, all, if the other six that we've just presented still leave you feeling stressed or unsure or lost or whatever is stressful to you, um, go there and, and check that out. So how does stress actually enhance us? How, stress is beneficial at times at a certain degree level. So if we look at stress between zero and 29%, um, that's considered low stress. And as stress is low, so too is motivation. Oh. So if we could sit in an easy chair and never get tired, never get bored, never get hungry, never have to go to the bathroom, we would, if, we, if there was never any discomfort, we would never get out of the chair. No. There and, we go. And so as discomfort increases, then stress increases with it. And so stress and motivation between 30 and 70% are actually beneficial. Those are motivators. That's 70% stress level is not too high for most people. There are a few that are really extreme introverts that that's too high, but for most people it isn't. The, the kicker though, is if stress continues to go up, beyond 70%. At that point, motivation drops off. And the reason it drops off is because now stress is too high. And our, and our, our, pre, our cognitive functions have now shut down. And we're just running on emotion. And we're trying to manage that. Got it. Okay, so the sweet spot where they run together is the 30 to 70%, which is a, it's a, it's a good hunk out of the middle of us. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we, we're and again, too low. And you, you know people who are live the stress-free life and they don't do anything. <laughs> they don't bother to accomplish anything. Why should they, right? And you, and you also know people that are on that high end of stress and they, and they want to accomplish things, but they can't because their brain's not functioning in the way that lets them. That mm -hmm. sweet spot, that sweet spot is 30 to 70%. All right. So we want to be 30 to 70% stressed. That's where we're going to be the most productive. And you know, that's where we're going to be the happiest, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've still got enough cognitive function to, to, to have the ability to exercise control. M Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, in his book called Flow, Optimal, mm -hmm. the Optimal Experience, um, he talks about flow being the, the space where you are totally absorbed in an activity. You're totally absorbed in accomplishing something that you believe you can accomplish. So you're in a place of motivation, you're in a place of movement, you're in a place of accomplishment when you're in flow. You know, Got it. And, and so, and in that space, we are perfectly happy, we are perfectly content, we're also motivated. So that 30 to 70% is your flow space. Cool, 30 to 70%. And above that, you get into knee jerk. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Above that, your stress levels are way too high. Been there, done that. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not, not, a, not a comfortable place to live from. All right. Me too. <laughs> so the key is personal control. And you, and you pointed out so beautifully that if you don't believe you have personal control, you know, 
that's a, a, a factor for misery. To the degree that we believe we have personal control, we have joy in our life. And so uh, from, there's a part of a poem from William Ernest Henley from Evictus, the poem called Evictus. It says, it does not, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And when we approach life that way, I am the master of my fate and I am the captain of my soul. Then we can manage. We, and if we know that it's, it's about stress management, not managing behaviors, but managing the core factors that cause those behaviors, then this becomes true for us. We become the master of our fate and the captain of our soul. There we go. Lovely thought. And I, I have here the um, image of the guide. So we have a guide available for your, your people to download. Um, it is called the same thing as what we just talked about, seven easy and super effective ways to banish stress and live your best life. So if you want a guide that you can refer to as you go through these seven things, this is a guide that will let you do it. Um, and you can find it at quantumleapsystems.com forward slash best life. All right. So that'll be in the chat box. And it is a little complicated for someone listening. And I know that. So I will read it out again, nice and slow. All right. It is quantum, Q-U-A-N-T-U-M, leap, L-E-A-P, systems, S-E-S-T-E-M-S. It's S-Y-S, Jackie. S-Y-S. What did I say? Oh, my goodness. S systems, S Y S T E M S dot com, and then forward slash best life. And so, popping that into the chat for everyone. And what a wonderful gift. Sherry, thank you. Um, that looks like a great tool. And I know that it will help a lot of people on this journey. So, the journey to go from controlling, from Living your life by default, having your attention go wherever the culture says for it to be. You know, so we have a very natural negative bias of the brain, and we have a negatively focused culture as far as our media goes. So to have choice that we don't get hijacked by that is such a great gift to everyone because too much time in there can really have a negative impact on oh. our sense of control yes yeah. well yeah and when, and, the, and like you said to the degree that you feel like you're out of control of your own outcomes mm -hmm. you're miserable and uh, you know and our goal is to reduce misery reduce stress increase joy because when we're in that space you know that's that's what life is about right got it okay so we will be um updating any just so i had a question i had somebody with the challenge with the link and so I just want to make it clear that we will update all links and you will get them. Um, and so we'll go there and we'll get that fixed. If anybody has a challenge, don't worry, we're on it. So in I'll the make sure it works. Yeah, Definitely. I know. <laughs> the, the background is a lot of fun things that go on in a live show. So the good news is not our first rodeo. We will make sure. <laughs> that you guys get what you need. And that's the joy of being here. So Sherry, now that we've managed the stress of Katie, who <laughs> Katie does all my tech support on this show. And so when something doesn't work, she tends to take it personally. And I'm good going, her. I wonder what we could do. <laughs> it's good for her that she takes it personally and responsible, absolutely. but even when it's something outside of our control, how often do we take things personally that have crossed that line that you've been talking about between what's not ours to control and what is? We frequently do because again, that concept and our values, our core values. So if a core value is that I should get things right, if, if that's a belief, you know, mm -hmm. then, um, then we're always striving to get things right. And when things aren't going right, we feel stressed. So that's one of those beliefs you take out and you examine, you go, well, do I really need to always get things right? And if things go wrong, what's the benefit of wanting things to go right? Well, the benefit is it, is it gives you an edge. It prevents you from getting sloppy and it, 
and it helps you to deliver to your clients what you promise you'll deliver. It helps you deliver to life what you promise to deliver. So wanting to get things right is a good thing as long as it doesn't run the show. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. I like that. Wanting to get things right is a good thing as long as it doesn't run the show. Right. And as you pointed out, stress is a good thing as long as it's not <laughs> running the show. <laughs> exactly. All right. So having lived my life in the stress mess most of my life, you know, I ended up coming into the world as a stress management consultant because I had the epitome of stress. Even without the part of my story that led to the creation of this show and the suicide prevention movement, the reality is, hey, any parent out there, I had three daughters all in high school at the same time. Wow. Do I need to say anything else? <laughs> I mean, the high school is still standing. And, you know, my daughters are all still here. And we are all on speaking terms now. <laughs> but when we talk about stress and this confusion around what's mine to control and what's not mine to control, you know, the illusion that we have control, I mean, that was a very painful period of time in my life, trying to sort out what was mine to control and what wasn't. And so all joking aside, because any parent who's nurtured children of any gender through junior high and high school years gets stressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, it, it goes with the territory. Um, but this journey, Sherry, you've had a um, you've had a great journey yourself through this. What brought you into this work? Um, it, it was an experience that I had when I was in my early twenties. Uh, it was just before the uh, uh, Independence Day celebration. Mm -hmm. I went to a drugstore to get vitamins and passed a magazine rack. And at the end of the magazine rack on end frame was a, a magazine with a picture of the American flag against a night sky and fireworks in the night sky. And to me, that said freedom and opportunity, because that's what America is about, right? Freedom mm -hmm. and opportunity. And I, and I picked up that magazine because that picture felt so good to me. And it's like freedom and opportunity. This is so awesome. And as fate would have it, when I opened the magazine, I'm thinking I'm going to open to some, you know, patriotic thing. As, as fate would have it, what I opened to was a Henry David Thoreau quote Ooh. that said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And it was like ice water in the face because for me, I, underst I knew that was true for me. The freedom and, and opportunity was out there, but what was true for me was I was living a life of quiet desperation. And that was true for almost everybody else I knew. And it was that extreme dichotomy that just hit me wrong. And I'm going, that isn't okay. It isn't okay for me. And it isn't okay for anybody else. This is not okay. And if this is a fact, if this, if this, is, this is a cause, and if there's a cause, there's a cure. And I, I intend to find the cure. And that's what set me on the path I've been on ever since. Oh, there we go. A mission-driven life. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I honestly believe that a mission-driven life is the cure for the ills of the world. That if you have something that you want to shift that is so big that you can't do it alone, that that's where life gets to be more fun. And more fun is what we're looking for in life. Why? Because the more fun you're having, the more distance there is between you and the ledge. Right. And that's all that this show is about. It's just about how do we get you a bigger buffer? How do we get you to where you are so much of a positive power plant, a, po a power plant of positivity that everyone you impact automatically gets a bigger buffer? That's the goal. So and you know what, what you what you just mentioned is a is a really important part of that for people to have a mission driven life. Mm -hmm. 
And that mission can be raising wonderful children. I mean, that it could be that. Um, it absolutely could. I mean, Emerson said he had a list of things that equal success. And one of them was, you know, having a garden plot or, you know, raising a child. And he had this whole list and they were all everyday things. That anybody could accomplish if they chose to. Mm -hmm. that any, and, and we all do, but what we don't do well is recognize that they are, that they really are accomplishments. Mm -hmm. You know, they really are. The sense that you change the world when you smile and you change the world double and triple if you smile at someone else. Yeah. You know, it, it's, well, it's an what, accomplishment. What you're saying now just reminds me of the starfish story. You know, the starfish where the little child's <laughs> walking along, throwing starfish back in the water, and some guy comes along and says, you know, you can't save them all, you know. You, can you can't make a difference doing that. The it you're one person. You cannot make a difference. So she picks up a starfish and throws it in the ocean and made a difference to that one. Yep. <laughs> there we go. The starfish story ranks up there with if you're an inspirational speaker in the making and you intend to take the stage, I highly recommend you do not ever tell the starfish story, the eagles and the turkey story. I mean, these are time-honored stories that no longer play well on the stage. No, they don't play well on the stage, but like I said, what you were just saying about yeah. a garden, understanding mm -hmm. that, that growing a garden has value. Oh, yeah, you know, It has value to your family. It has value to you. It has value to yeah. understand that those little things that we take for granted that, and, and the odd thing is the easier it is for us to do, the, the easier it comes, the less value we give it. Oh, you I know. train coaches and I see it all the time in coaches. They don't value what comes easy to them. It's the same with messengers. It's the same with practitioners. It's the same with anyone who has a gift. Yeah. Because it comes easy, there's this part of the brain that projects it onto everyone else and says, <laughs> well, it must be easy for everyone else too. Exactly. It can't have value because it's easy. And part of that is there was a work edit ethic that tied money with hard work right. instead of wouldn't it be wonderful if somewhere along the line we'd gotten the message that and connected money to fun? Yes. You know, when you can shift that connection in your brain and break that habit of thinking that money and hard work go together your abundance factor goes up. I mean, this is what I took out of the book flow. It was like, wait a minute, let's just rewrite what I, you know, let's unhook what doesn't work and hook it to something else. Right. Once I decided that I could let my money, my mission and my merriment all occur together, that I they were that. the best playmates ever. I my world that. started to change. I love that money, mission and merriment. Money, beautiful. mission, and merriment. Beautiful. And when I talk about this, and my mission is to make suicide a thing of the past, and the power that people assign to the word, the power that people assign to the concept of suicide prevention, thinking that suicide prevention is for people who are known to be at risk. And I'm like, no, 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 that's intervention. <laughs> If they're known to be at risk, they need intervention. Yeah. And I didn't realize that this was going to be such a painful place for me until just this past week when um, a gentleman who's been struggling and he says the fight to prevent suicide in his life is just that. And he feels very bloodied and bruised. And so that's where I had to get really, really clear about my language. And, yeah, but you know, and, your approach is, is the right approach. And the, and while there are people who, who look at the, the merriment part and go, how can you tie merriment or fun to suicide? Well, because if people are, are wallowing in, this, in the sadness, if they're, if they're looking at the wrong end of the spectrum, that's what they're going to get more of. And you're, you're saying, let's, let's lighten these things up and get you into a light, happy space. And you're never even going to think about suicide if you're in that light, happy space. I finally wrote an article about it and posted it on LinkedIn um, just yesterday, I believe it was. And the power of that article is such that 
it just gave me a chance to get really, really, really clear and to come down and say, it's this way in my world. And it's okay if it's not this way in your world. Yeah. And when we can honor the fact that in your world, it looks really dark and it looks really painful and it looks like it's a fight and it's going to be a fight. And that's your perspective and that's what you're living. And as long as you are okay with that being the decision you make, I'm good. I am not here to convince you of anything. And it's not mine. It's not my belief system. My belief system based on over 30 years in this stress management world and as a transformative mediator. And I, I mean, I got more sort of, I'm totally certifiable. I am certified in a bunch of different things. Yeah. And, and my perspective is that why not? Why not use fun to prevent suicide. We use fun to learn anything. Fun is the natural reward system in our brain for learning something new. And that's why I've partnered with people who do the neuro gamification. They're actually gamifying one of my training programs, the advocacy coaching program. I am so excited. We're going to take what I've been doing, which has been some really heavy lifting, helping people learn to be better advocates for themselves and turn it into a game and turn the whole coaching certification into a game. And awesome. that is so exciting. So That's awesome. I just, Sherry, I appreciate your support in this so very, very much. I'm, I'm not a big proponent of judging things as right or wrong. What I am hoping is that there will be something effective in what we bring forth today, something effective in what this movement has to say that will just buy people a little more space between themselves and the ledge. Yeah. Because if we can get you to pause, maybe we can get you to play. And if we can get you to play, we can keep you here. We can get you to stay. Exactly. Love it. I love the work you're doing. And you, you, you've just yeah, you can, your heart and soul is into it. And, you know, it's just, you're doing some amazing things. Bless you for that. Can't do it alone, Sherry. So I really appreciate you for showing up today. Thank you. Thank you.